entrepreneurs and talk about the tunis and you know having a connection to Africa that he gained as he went on his life versus only knowing America and only knowing being African American. And then I talk about uh, Philip Wheaton and her religious thing because I, I did some research before I started doing the paper, I started talking about recording, I did some research on her. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very it's very uh, it's hard to deal with some of the things that she says when, in terms of you know religion and you know kind mm-hmm. of God will fix it if you have faith in God if, if you know what I mean yeah but when you do research on her and you find you know you learn about her you understand you understand it's like I can I can criticize what she believes but I can also understand why she believe those things because that's the way when you come over as a slave very young and that and you're taught those things that you know if you just believe in God that your issues will be fixed. I can understand how she would be in that perspective. I don't agree with that, but I kinda have to reconcile it because that's what it that's what it is and that's she wasn't the only she wouldn't have been the only person to believe that. She's not the only person who believes that today. So mm-hmm. I think it's very representative of two ideas that can be can be seen in the community today. What there are plenty of religious people that believe that the reason we want to so much is because of our lack of relationship with God is good. And there are plenty of people that believe if we take a step back, if we study our history, if we learn and we reconnect with you know, our ancestors, you will, you will be able to better fight the internal racism. And so that's just what I was thinking about. I can't stand here. People read my, people read my paper back. It's like, hey, Sorry. Oh, I felt the same thing. Yeah. She my yeah. like, oh. It's like, it's like the corneas up here, your voice is just eating. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's what, that's what I was going, that's what I was going through in my head. And as I've sat down looking at her vision through, uh, Suggested mm-hmm. I'll you know continue to work with that in my head until I actually sit down and write the second part I add on to it. Why do you two not like to hear your own voice? It sounds better in my head. It, it does. <laughs> I, from here it sounds fine, but when I record it and go back and listen to it, I'm like that's my sound. Like. How do yeah. I have friends? I would. I, I would want to hear. I would want to hear my voice. I talk. I really think the recordings of what you and Anaya say in class are some of the oh, best I, stuff I, in I class. Skip. I talk, I skip. I, talk. I mean, I. Y'all two voices sound great. I can't do it. Nah, I can't do it. You're, you're crazy. Nah, you're crazy. Yeah, Brock, you know how to talk. You Brock, to stop. I think you should actually do a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so at the same time, a painful, abusive relationship with a home you do know causes a, div- a divide. Um, and consequently, perhaps, sometimes the self-loathing that comes with internalized racism, right? So is that a fair enough summary of what you just said? Okay, so that's your argument. African Americans feel a need to mend that. I'm gonna call it a rift, because it's fun to use different words for divide. (laughs) Yeah, Um, and, and with me, like words pop into my head all the time. I know that that's not the truth for everybody, so just, you know, don't feel badly about the fact that you. Right. I mean, the thing is, like, I read so much that I just know a whole bunch of words. And since I read more um, old stuff that's really complicated, then you just get more words in your head. So if I stuck more to the really fun stuff, then, like, for example, I love young adult literature. I listen to that all the time. 
but it doesn't necessarily build my vocabulary in the way that getting a doctorate and writing a book about 19th century literature did. <laughs> so anyway, um, and plus when you have this image in your head that you're describing in your argument and you're saying divide, 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 because you're imagining the divide, that's great. Just go back later and think about different ways to, you know, what other words might work well. Um, so African Americans feel they need to mend that rift in a way that neither side of the Tunis, let's say, gets lost. Barack, take it easy. <laughs> Barack is so self-critical. Oh my goodness. I should have brought the dog so you could like have a, a comfort animal while we're doing this. <laughs> so, so there, I mean, that really kind of sets you up really well. So, um, Wheatley does take this religious view despite, despite the fact that, let's just make this a little simpler. Because when you speak, you speak very directly, but sometimes um, it's hard to put that into just you. And also when you're thinking about different ways of phrasing, very often people are thinking of different ways of phrasing what they want to write and put all of, the, all of them in the sentence. So despite the fact that many of the same pe uh, or many of the people who taught Wheatley religion So I think what you're saying here is really um, important and interesting. I'm just trying to make it more direct. Despite the fact that many of the people who taught Wheatley about this faith also endorse the idea that the color is a diabolic dye. Um, she does not view these people as representative of her Lord and Savior, which is interesting. Just like I said, with the research of it and reading the poem, I don't get the because you know some people, some people when they think of God, they think of like when, when, Go ahead. when I read uh, when I read her poem and I learned more about her and you know her being taken as a slave very young, mm -hmm. being raised in a house and being and that's what she learned, that's what she learned her religion. It, the, the point where I get the point where I get the idea that she doesn't view her people as the God as a people is because she was she was born in Africa. So she has memories of those religions very very from when she was very young. But she does have some memories of those. And the way she cast them aside as just wrong and this almost, I don't, I don't exactly, just almost, I don't want to say evil, but you, you, get, you get the idea. Like mm -hmm. she, she, she views them as just this wrong, and the reason that some of these things are happening is because they don't have a relationship with this guy that she's learned. I can't, I can't have, I don't think that in, that in her head, from what I've read about her, and from what I've read from her, that when she, thinks of God, she thinks of her people. Yeah. Because, you know, there's, there's people in the black community, when they think of God and Jesus, they see a black face. Yes. They see a person that looks like them, a person that's comforting to them, a person that reminds them of the people they're around. And when I think of Phyllis Wheatley, I think she thinks the same thing. The only issue is the people she's around and the people that have comforted her have been white people. I think that's where that comes from. I 
the best way. Like, like I said, it's very, it's, I'm, I'm critical of the way she, the way she thinks and the way she believes, but I, I also understand where it comes from because there, there are plenty, there, like I said, the people in this day age that if you're raised around a certain way and a certain group of people, those are going to be the group of people you find comfort in. Mm -hmm. And it can be very hard to, to fight that, to, to rid yourself of that, to find comfort in a new community when you spent 20, 30 years of your life surrounded by this one community and they, as far as you know, they treated you well. I, I agree with you and I also <clears throat> want to point out that the um, prosperity gospel is it came from New England and those Puritans and that, you know, the, the place where revolutionary America, where Wheatley converted to Christianity, involves white people who believe that God gave them the United States. God gave them money because of their good works, you know. So the prosperity gospel continues in American religion to this day, as you say, and it provides a sense of certainty that follow these rules and you can have everything and God will take care of it. It provides a sense of certainty that is a really nice vacation from real life, especially when we're dealing with forces like racism, right? So, I, and I think that does frustrate you. I think with Wheatley, go ahead. <laughs> The reason, the reason it's so hard in when I, when it comes to the religion aspect, which is why I said I want to bring up Malcolm X in mm -hmm. the last part, is because religion is not all negative. You know what I mean? I under, I can, I can picture because I know so many, like I said, I know so many people in the day that religion is the reason they get out of bed every day and they do the things they have to do to survive. It's because that security they feel that you know it'll all be worth it and if I live my life good and I do the right things, it will work out for me, maybe not on in this lifetime, but in whatever the next. And yet it's just so it's so tough that to just you know, it's just the dismissal mm -hmm. of her people that she was just that she has memories of. It's not like she was it's not like she was, you know, born over here and she has no memories of Africa. Or it's not like she was, she was so young that she had, she has memories of it. She remembered it. She, if she hasn't even remembered it, she's heard stories from other slaves on the plantation she mm -hmm. And yet it's so dismissive. And I think that's the part that brings an emotion out of me. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's one thing to be, I, it's one thing to be religious. I mean, be religious. It's one thing yeah. to be religious. One thing to have that belief and that faith and that driving force behind you, that extra thing that makes you do what you do every day. But it's a whole other thing to be, to take it to the point that you're dismissive of everybody else and their beliefs and the things that they do and they believe. Yeah. And like I said, I understand why she liked that way, but I just, <laughs> it's, it's just hard. You know what I mean? I know, I know. And so here we have another case. Here we have another case of the possible re-traumatization that comes with African-American literature. And for that reason, when I read Being Brought from Africa to America, I think more about the commas than I do about the words. That there is a God, that there is a savior too. Which could also mean, yes, there's a God, not taking issue with that, but also, oh, there's Jesus. Wheatley, as someone who probably had memorized the Quran and could possibly write it from memory, and was a Muslim, was like, okay, I, uh, God, all right, I got it, people. And so Jesus, yeah, okay, he wasn't the savior to me, but if you insist, and if you think he's going to refine you, and you can go to heaven with all this shit you're doing because you're calling me diabolic, <laughs> you know. I, that's why I read Wheatley as very subtly offering, you know, on the surface, seeming to say, oh, I converted to Christianity, it was mercy, it's all good. 
But I also see her as situating her commas in a way that you can read it as her saying, yep, okay, there's, so, all right, so you could go to heaven too, white people. Why don't you get your shit together, you know? So that's why that's why I read I read the poem differently than you do. However, your reading of the poem is equally equally legitimate, and it's just good that we can argue about it. When Wheatley writes to Samson Occam and says, you know, we all have that within us. We all want freedom. That's one of the only moments when we really see Wheatley speak her mind because she was. She had to answer to all of these white people. And when she went out on her own to be with her husband and raise her family, they no longer had anything to do with her, you know, and, and they struggled. But she, she was in this bubble. And so she was in the bubble, the Countess of Huntingdon, who she writes about um, Wheelock, I think, or Whitlock. Okay, I'm forgetting his name, but he was a really important Enlightenment minister who was good friends with the Countess of Huntingdon. And so this guy, this preacher, preached the, this um, charismatic message of, and people could be slain by the Spirit. And the whole Second Great Awakening started in the United States in large part because of him. And he was friends with the Countess of Huntingdon and he um, was someone that Wheatley wrote about. And he also knew this man named John Merritt, who was a black preacher, who was a free black man born in New York, whose family moved to South Carolina and were living around Charleston in the free black community there. And then there was also this man called Prince Saunders, who was born free and lived, was born in New England and stayed in New England, who traveled to Europe and did some pretty hilarious things like passing himself off as an African prince in court at Europe. So there's this small cadre of black intellectual people, including Wheatley, Marant, um, Saunders, and they, they also knew Prince Howell. And they, I find them hilarious because I choose to read in between the lines of what they write as kind of nudging each other, like, okay, so we can't say this about white people in front of them, but we're gonna like, you know, you too could be refined and join the angelic train. Oh, you think I'm gonna be saved by Jesus? Maybe you'll be saved by Jesus. It's a joke to me. And I imagine them having these conversations. If Prince Saunders' sense of humor is hilarious. In John Merritt's sermon, he says that white people are evil monsters because they don't love their neighbor. So, you know, this is her social network. So that's how I choose to read Wheatley that way. And again, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna read Wheatley that way. Wheatley is a Muslim woman who is circumscribed and very limited because she's not gonna get published or have a voice if she doesn't play nicely with all these white people. But when she's talking to Sanson Occam, the Indian, when she's, you know, John Merritt, Prince Saunders, I would love to, I would love to, maybe I need to write a play or something about them all getting together for dinner and talking about what they really think. Go ahead. Well, my question becomes, is it, is that, is being published worth it in that situation where then you're, where then if you take it as, okay, we're going to put it, we're going to write it like this so we can mm -hmm. interpret it multiple different ways. Mm -hmm. Does 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 that hurt in a way? Because then you could have these white people come up and be like, "Oh, see, she was a slave and she appreciated us, giving her." You yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that can be more detriment more detrimental than a lot of things mm -hmm. because it's one thing for them to believe that, but to have the ability to pull out this renowned poet and be like, "See." This this is what we're talking about, and we have people because that's that you you don't even you you going from just justifying it here, you can justify it internationally. Like, see, we have people over here that like us, they like being in sleep, they like us mm -hmm. putting our religion on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I I think I just think that's dangerous. Even, yeah. Even, even even if even even because hearing that from you, I can believe that I might interpret I interpreted the poem incorrectly. Mm -hmm. But 
I can also say looking at it the way you look at it, I also think that's just it's dangerous to do that. I don't think it's worth being this published poem. If you want to put yeah. out there like that, it can be interpreted in a way that's supportive of those things. Even yeah. if you know, even if you and your community know, I mean, that's not really what we know. We, we think they're crazy. We think they're insane. We think they're evil monsters. Yeah. If you're not willing to write that down on paper and yeah. be clear with it, it can be very dangerous to your community because it looks like you're it looks like you're supportive of these things being done. Even if that's not what you mean. Yeah. If they can justify it by using that, it's yeah. I don't and that's just hot. That's just hot. Okay, so it's a really dangerous position, and I agree fully with what you said, and I think this is a really good debate. And I, I also think that you need to think about David Walker, who said all those things right out loud and got poisoned and murdered. So um, if Wheatley didn't do this shit, if Wheatley didn't... Huh? Or if we, but if Wheatley didn't do this, we wouldn't know who she was, and she never would have been freed, and she never would have been published. There would have not been the, the African-American woman poet. Sure, Thomas Jefferson said, oh, well, God can make um, Wheatley a poet, but he cannot make her sing. You know, and, but at least there's this argument, like, oh, there's a black woman who can be a poet? And, and, and Jefferson's like, oh, but she's not really a good poet. You know, her very presence stands against this language of race that they're creating, even if she, she's not singing, no, she's, maybe Jefferson knew that she wasn't really singing because she wasn't really telling the truth. Jefferson didn't know that, that was a really far out reading, but anyway, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I meant to turn that off, I don't know what I'm doing, go ahead. I would say, It is important to have that purse and to have that stepping stone onto hearing that type of thing because I'm sure you can leave the stepping stones from her to Toni Morrison to the modern day that we have today. And that is that is true. The issue I have is that you have to you have to look around and see is me being that first now worth the potential damage it can do now. And I can I, I can't make that judgment because I wasn't alive during those times. Right. I did have to make that decision myself. And I can see the positives and negatives with making both of those decisions. But when you have when you it's a it's a even if they're not in on the joke, they're laughing at you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I just I, I just look at it and it's like, and then I talk about, you know, the other religious view of Malcolm. Yeah. You talk about how he would he how he made the decision that he would have rather died than do those type of things once he found his once he found his religion and he found something to stand on. He decided that he'd rather he multiple times he knew he faked death for the things he said out loud. Right. And I say that to say if this if this religion you have is this source of faith and this source of security, why do you need to why do you need to do that thing for you know what I mean? Why do you need to take that step of I need to do this because it will keep me safe if your if you feel your religion is that security? Because that that's how when you read Malcolm, you you know that he he knows death is will be early in his life. He know he should probably live to see 90, but he'll die before he hits 60. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yet he never he, he never sounds fearful of it because he understands his religion is his security. Right. And yet when you say that, you know, at that time you had to worry about being poisoned, which I understand because I'm not saying this, I'm not yeah. saying it's a good thing to be like, okay, I'm ready to die. Yeah. But if you're gonna paint your religion as this security, you got you got you gotta live by that. You yeah. Know? That's Just like true. With anything else when you talk about religion, yeah. You talk about people being doing what saying one thing and doing the other yeah yeah you got you got you got you got to live by that you can't right. say that here and then go in these poems and write them so they're okay for a white audience that's not how it works you yeah. can't be behind closed doors saying yeah i love my people these white people are crazy and then go ahead and write yeah. these poems so they can be read 
Yeah. By white people, and they can sound supportive. You, you just can't. You can't do that, and then want me to come back generations later and be like, "You did everything right." Okay. I, you see what I mean? Okay. We are running out of. Whoops. Sorry. We're running out of time, and I completely agree with you. And um, you have completely demonstrated exactly how we need to talk about African American literature. That people, African American writers, don't agree. That all of us don't agree within African American studies. You know what's really going on. That these are debates and complexities. And you know, it's it's there's just a lot to think about. What I want to point out um, linguistically here is when you talk about power. Um, the power to do this and this and this. This is what I did with the sentence to make what you say into the powerful statement that it is as we read it on the page. So despite the fact that many of the people who taught Wheatley about this faith also endorsed the idea that their color is their diabolical dye, she does not view these people as representative of her Lord and Savior. Then you have this, and I changed this sentence to have a colon followed by a series of repeated the power to, the power to, separated by semicolons, because rhetorically, even oratorically, this becomes dynamite. And you, you, it's what you had, but I just changed punctuation, which is why I say Wheatley's punctuation also. Very smart. <laughs> anyway, um, racism is bigotry and discrimination with power, colon, the power to cause a divide in a person's mind and force them to spend decades of their life trying to unite this divide. The power to erase the history of a people and tell the descendants of those people their ancestors came from a pagan land. The power to describe the enslavement and mass murder of those same people and their descendants as mercy. The power to implant the belief that those same slave-owning slave -owning, mass murdering people can then be refined or cleansed of the sins they refuse to acknowledge. Oh! I added maybe a few words and just kind of rephrased what Wheatley was saying and you took what Wheatley has and you... Uh, Oh my God, that is beautiful, okay? So don't, don't keep complaining about not liking to hear your words read back to you because that is stunning and wonderful, okay? All because of my little additions and punctuation. That's what I need. I need to <laughs> I will, I will, I will. Don't worry. Okay, so yeah, so I really look forward to what you, what you say about Malcolm. I think you need a blog. I think you need to publish this stuff. I think it should also be in a podcast. I think you should take Maharan Renaissance class next semester, and then we can do these blogs and podcast projects. And Anaya, even though she's not officially taking the class, will join us. And we're gonna, you're gonna, we're gonna speak the truth to the people. Okay. All right. So I'll send this to you too. And um, everybody else, if you have questions or you didn't get your email, let me know.